Today in the house, we have none other than Chandu, all the way from Wellington in New Zealand. I have been a long time follower and a big fan of his work on Excel. And I doubt that any avid user of Excel out there would not have heard of the Chandu. Just like the last episode with Mark Proctor, I invited Chandu this time to have a little Paho Query Tricks battle with me, where we are going to share one trick after the other. And you in the comments have to rate us that whose trick did you find better? Well, enough being said, you already know the rules of the game. We have Chandu in the house. Let's go catch up with him. All right, today we have Chandu with us all the way from Wellington, um, in New Zealand. Thank you, Chandu, for being here. So awesome to have you over and over again. Thanks, Chandeep. How are you? Very well, thank you. What time is it there? It's uh, half past five in the evening now. Ah, nice, I caught you in the evening. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I doubt that there is any person working with Excel who doesn't know who you are. But even if we give the benefit of the doubt to the audience, even if there is one person out there who doesn't know who you are, can you please maybe take a minute to describe what is the kind of work that you do, who you are and stuff like that? Thanks, Chandeep. <laughs> That's so nice of you. Um, hello there. My name is Chandu and uh, my mission is to make people awesome in their work. I've been doing this through my website and on my YouTube channel for the last 15 years now. And what I do is I create tutorials, information, examples, and um, training programs on various things related to data analysis in Excel and Power BI. You can find out more about me on my website, chendu.org, or on YouTube, or you can just go to your favorite search engine, type Chandu, and search for me and you can find information about me there excellent excellent we have done one before but that was more of like a chit chat uh, on your experiences with uh, power bi and dax and other things around data analysis and stuff but this one is more of an action oriented video i did one with mark proctor um, mm -hmm. about two yeah, months ago that. and people really liked it <laughs> i thought i'll just text you i mean i was just uh, watching television the other day and i was watching my own video and i thought who else can I do this with? And just, you know, the uh, the other name that struck to me was none other than your name. So I thought, hey, let's just have you on the channel. Let's just do some head on hand uh, tricks on Power Query. Awesome to be part of this. I saw the video with Mark and I think uh, that's Thank a you. great idea to kind of, not a really a battle, but uh, just <laughs> I, talk about some yeah. data challenges that you and I come Absolutely. across and, you know, share yeah. some, uh, some things with the with each Absolutely. other as well as with the audience. Absolutely. Um, which super character or super hero character do you like? We can we can just assign that uh, to you <laughs> while you're editing the video. <laughs> okay, uh, I would love to be Rajini Kant. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess people mm. people outside would definitely have to reg, uh, Google for Rajnikant as well. But sure enough, we can we can do some uh, animation for Rajnikant yeah. and yeah. Uh, have you animated as well. Okay, so rules of the game, Chandu. Um, mm -hmm. We trade tricks. Obviously, I will let you go first. If people like your trick, people will give you a point. If people like my trick, they can give me a point. And let's just see that at the end of this game, who accumulates more points? Good to go. Sounds great. Yeah. Here we are, uh, Power Query Tricks. What I have is a really simple file. Obviously, you don't really need any of the files if you want. You can still kind of follow along and pick up the tricks, but uh, Power Query is essentially a data platform, so you do need some data to use it. Sure. So I, I made up some numbers and uh, we're going to sure. go through that. Sure. The very first trick that I'm going to share doesn't even require anything in Power Query. So we are going to go to the data, get data, and make a blank query so that okay. we can just jump into the query editor and from there I can explain. So this first one is to create a list on the fly, kind of like a shorthand list. Mm -hmm. And when you make a blank query, obviously Power Query doesn't know what this query should hold. So it's going to put us right here into the formula bar. And here you can open curly brackets, one dot dot 10. And what that does is it basically makes a list for you on the go. So this is the syntax. Uh, we are just saying curly brackets, one dot dot 10, um, which I think stands for, give me a list starting from one with 
ten values. Yeah, oh, or, interesting. Yeah, and then we are going to get that list. We we'll, I will expand on this particular trick in my next one, but if you ever need to kind of make a, a quick list in a rush, yeah, sure. this is the easy trick. Oh, excellent, excellent! Thank you so much, and uh, that was awesome. The trick is that a lot of times one would have to create um, like an if condition, but you but you also want to reference the other column. So let's just say that I want to work with the sales value column. And if the tax percentage is above 3%, that means for all of these values where it's above 3%, I would like to multiply this with the, the sales value and find out that what is the additive tax applied on the sales value. Mm -hmm. So when I'm working with this column, I obviously have to refer to the tax, take a look at what the tax percentage is. And then if the tax percentage is more than 3%, then I'll have to do the multiplication. Otherwise, I don't do the multiplication. Now, mostly what people are going to do is they're going to create one more column, which is going to be, let's say, the new sales, which is where they write an if condition, do the multiplication based on the check. And otherwise, they will just perform the same sales value. Now, that's fine. But the only problem is that you create one more column with that. And then you'll have to come and delete this column in case you don't really want the old column. Now, a lot of people will try something like this. So they will go ahead. I mean, at least with the people who know a bit of M. So they will go ahead and say the table dot transform columns and they will start. So they will say, hey, I'm trying to work with the table, which is the source table uh, in the previous step, which is right here. And in this, uh, I am trying to work with the which column was that? Uh, let's just take a look. That was a sales value column. So I'll say that, hey, I'm trying to work with the sales value column. So I'll just say sales value. And then they will write, start writing each. And then I'll say if, and they will start writing the conditions. So they'll say something like if tax um, is greater than, let's say, I don't know, 0.3%, uh, that's 3%, uh, then uh, do something. So let's just say then I want to do 100, uh, else I want to do nothing, else just give me the just give me the uh, what's that sales value so sales value now the problem with this particular approach is that when you are working with um, I think the spelling was incorrect so transform columns so the the problem with this particular approach is that when you are working with table dot transform column function and you input the sales value column that you would want to work with, it is not able to take a look at the tax column, which is adjacent to it. So the only value that you can take a look at is the sales value column, which was right here, but not the adjacent value. And that's why you get this error. Now, what do we do? Well, rather than actually working with one column, we will actually work with the entire row. So we will work with the first row that gives us access to all the three values. Then we will work with the second row that gives us the access to all three values and so on and so forth. So what we can do is rather than actually applying this function table dot transform columns, I will rather say table dot transform rows instead. So I'll say table dot transform rows. Again, the table that I'm trying to work with is the source table. And then I'm going to say something like this. And if you just take a look at the second part here, it says, what is your transformation as a function? So I'm going to say that I'm trying to maybe work with uh, the tax column. So I'll say if the tax column is greater than uh, 0.03%, that's the percentage. Then I would want to have the sales value value uh, multiplied with the tax rate. So multiply with one plus tax. Else I'm going to say that give me the sales value right here. And I'll close the bracket and hopefully this should work. And this actually works. Now, the only problem is that we started off working with the table, but we ended up getting a list. Although if you take a look at the first three values, which are which are above uh, the 3% mark, they were well, the, these values were 77, 65 and 96. They have been revised to new values and the rest of the values stay the same. But I don't really want to have a list. I instead want to have a table like the table that I started with. So what I'm going to do is I am going to loop like nest this in a record. So this becomes a record and record should have two parts. So let me just say that this is my sales and that is my record and if you now press enter nothing changes you just get a record simple as that now once you have a record you can actually kind of concatenate this with the record so if i just say each underscore this is the record and i'm concatenating this record that i have created with the record that i initially had now if you take a look we still get a record but in the record we have four fields now so we have the date we have the sales value and we have the tax and the sales the new sales that we have calculated now what we can do is just simply go ahead and pack these records into a table so i can just go ahead and say something like maybe in a new step 
just to make it cleaner so i can say table dot from uh, records and i'll just reference back to the previous step which is custom one and then it gives me a choice to pick up if i have any columns to choose from so let's just say that the first column that i would want to have as a date the second column is going to be my sales that's the new column that i've created and maybe the third column is going to be the tax close the bracket and press enter and we get the table which is where we have revised the, the tax values now at the moment we just applied one condition but sure enough if you have multiple conditions or multiple columns to work with because you have the access to the record by using the table dot transform rows you can write as many conditions as possible do all the transformations in one go and just put it back together into a table without actually adding columns and then deleting columns so that was uh, a trick of working with adjacent columns in case you want to transform the very columns instead that is cool okay excellent over to you while we are here uh, i want to be honest i almost never do that level of m coding <laughs> it has been many many years since i've had to do such things simply because uh, one i'm way too lazy for that <laughs> i would i mean you would probably think in all of this session the list uh, kind of shorthand version of creating the list is the most m code that i'm going to write hopefully that's fine that is fine <laughs> in fact there is there there are more people out there who work with power query than with the m code so yeah. uh, i think you will have a lot of brownie points coming in so all right so the first one that we did is make a list like i said normally you would you wouldn't really need to make a list like this i mean there are some exceptional scenarios like if you want to make a bunch of numbers for whatever reason or taking the idea of numbers or dates if you want to make a bunch of dates or uh, you want to generate all possible combinations for something where there are numbers then this kind of a thing will help um, but i'm just gonna jump back into excel for a second there and then bring some of my data so here i have got uh, three data sets um, but it doesn't really matter it can be any data so this is uh, some sample shipment data of chocolates uh, just a few rows and we are going to refer to this data a couple of times through the program so i'm going to bring this into power bi it's in a table uh, the table name is called shipments and uh, i'll just say from table range so that we bring it here let's say i'm looking at this and you're seeing there is 90 units here 12 units there 66 units there uh, like this so each each is a box of shipments and this this particular shipment had 90 that one has 66 12 like that and for whatever reason you may want to expand this table and have for example 90 rows here exactly same information but 90 mm -hmm. records and mm -hmm. this one you want to have 12 records you want to have mm -hmm. 66 records so mm -hmm. you want to blow this up and and generate all the rows each row with one one unit maybe sure. you got some reason for this uh, sure so this is where we could use the same list technique to do this so we are going to say add column and we are going to make a custom column and uh, you don't really have to name this uh, and we can say here in the custom column we could for example say one dot dot ten uh -huh. and that's just going to make a list of 10 values for each each row so if you select the list you can see here yeah um, the the list of okay. items that we have yeah. okay now what we want is we want to have a list that is equal to the number of units that i have there so i'm gonna change this code and go to the end point and that end point i'll delete and bring in the units there so that's basically giving me a list but first list ah, will nice. have uh, i mean it doesn't really show the preview here but you can yeah, see yeah. this one has 12 uh, this one has 66 but it i think it stops after 20 uh, and and it kind of basically generates those lists for us that's right so once these lists are there we are just going to expand and extract yeah. new rows which will generate all the 90 numbers for the first guy you can see up to uh, 90 and then it goes to 1 to 12 and at this point our list our original table is blown up now it has as many rows as the total number of units and i can just delete this um, so that we have essentially expanded the table and generated one row for each of the unit that we are shipping you could kind of keep it and use it as a unit number if you want to use that for some analysis but that's the trick 
Yeah, interesting. In fact, if I recall correctly, I had a very similar problem where I had a weekly roster and the weekly roster then had to be expanded to the annual roster because the roster is going to stay the same for the entire year. So they would give mm. a weekly roster and you would have to expand it 52 times for the entire entire year. So you just have to take the yeah. same number of rows and expand it 52 number of times and that's where this could mm. have been used and that's that's brilliant. All right. So the next one is like simple, but I believe it's quite effective um, at a few places where people would like to perform something beyond the user interface of Power Query. So it's simple, although the trick is very simple. So back at my screen again, what I have done is I have duplicated my trick one as the source step to trick number two. So if you take a look, I'm currently working on trick number two, but the source step right here actually refers back to trick number one. That means I'm taking a look at the last step. So whatever was the last step here, that's what I am taking a look at in this particular query. That's fine. But a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes people would like to refer an intermediary step somewhere in between. So at the moment, if you take a look, we have uh, three steps right here. We have the source, we have the custom, which are the no nothing but the records. And then we have custom two, which is nothing but the table put together. For some reason, Maybe the user wants to pick up the custom one step, which is not really the last step. It's one of the intermediary steps. Then how do you do that? The trick is that you go back to the query, which contains multiple steps. And on the last step, you use the meta keyword. So in the end, I'm going to use the meta keyword. And in the, as in a record in the meta, I will declare a column name. Could be any column name, doesn't matter. So I'm just going to call this as my step. And the step that I want to fetch uh, in the meta keyword is going to be the custom one step. Now, what the meta keyword is going to do is it's just going to store in the mind the value of custom one. That's it. That's all that it's going to do. It's not going to change the table that is physically loaded on the screen. So I'm just going to say, hey, I'm just trying to refer to custom one, uh, which is one of the steps in between and press enter. Nothing changes. The output remains the same. That's pretty much it. Now, if I go back to trick number two, uh, which is my query, I'm still referring to trick number one, but I'm still getting the last step. Now, the trick to fetch the data of the meta that we have defined is by using the keyword value dot meta data. So if I just maybe wrap the trick one in the value dot metadata, the last step contained the metadata and the, the column name was step and I can just take a look at right here. Now what I can just do is from this particular value dot metadata, I can just extract the step. I can just click right here or perhaps I can also just maybe reference the step. So step press enter and those are my steps like it's the second step of the query one of the intermediary steps of the query not really the mm -hmm. last step so if you want to do something where you want to fetch one of the intermediary steps you can reference it in, in the meta and just pull it apart using the value.metadata function that was my trick what else can you do with the meta keyword what, what does it really do well the meta actually can store uh, anything so you can probably store the name of the step, you can store an intermediary value, you can store a function here, you can store, like you can create multiple columns and do a lot of other things. So you can maybe have a function. So I'm just gonna say function. In case you have used a function, you can just actually reference a custom function here as well. And then mm -hmm. once you have stored this, then using value.metadata, you can just pull it apart and then use it in any way that you like in any other query that you're working on. It reduces the clutter that we often produce while we're working with queries, just because we want to duplicate the query, fetch another step and things like that. So just a nice way of packing things around. So would the meta be visible outside of the Power Query? Like if you- It would not. So you load the query, the this is going to get loaded, yes. Okay, so meta is something that kind of stays here. Mm. Yeah. All right, that's pretty cool. Over to you. So my next one uses another kind of data, but we will come back to this data and have a play with this again. I'll show you uh, one data. Usually when you when you are getting data into Power Query, sometimes it can come from a pre-existing report that is maintained by a finance system or another kind of system. And usually those systems tend to have this sort of a format where it's not really data extract, it's actually an output of a report. So somebody runs a mm, report, mm. downloads the data, and then that becomes your source. Yeah. So here I have got a kind of like a pivot table structure, but it's also not really a pivot table. It doesn't really have a rhyme and rhythm anywhere. 
uh, for example, first three months are here and then there is a total column. Next three mm-hmm. months followed by a total, but then for whatever reason, they choose to only add two more months, put a total in between, two more months total. Um, ah, and then that okay. kind of continues. So it's, yeah, okay. even if there is okay. consistency, um, it is still a, an annoying format because you've got all these total columns and there could be one total column. There could be like multiple total columns, like four quarters, individual total columns, and then a year total. And then that repeats. And when you want to take this and then just load it into Power Query and clean it up where you don't care about these total rows. You just want what was the value for each month for each of the geographies. Hmm. Then it becomes an annoying thing. So what I have done is I have uh, set it up here and I have created a name range for this called refund data. Okay. Um, as it's not really a table, so we can't have it as a tabular format anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's uh, load this into Power Query. And then I'll show you one trick that uh, I find particularly helpful when I'm dealing with this kind of uh, data formats where things are there, but they're not where they're supposed to be. So obviously row number one is useless here. So we can go to the remove rows, remove top and just take out the first row. So Mm -hmm. that's gone. Now we have the data, we have got geography and then each month is one column and occasionally we have got total columns there. That's right. The problem is we don't want these total columns, but we don't know if this is going to be column five, column nine. So we could, for example, hold down control and multi-select all of these columns and try and remove them. And the problem with this approach is it kind of makes an assumption that that is the column where the total would be. When you rerun this report next month, you might have a different way of laying layout and that that will break it. So. Instead, what I want is I want to remove all of these arbitrary total columns in one go. So the trick here is first up, we are going to use this transpose option to flip this table. So right now, all of these are columns. We are going to turn them into rows. So when you transpose, your table now becomes like this. Uh And then here you can clearly see what the problem is. And you have got these total rows that shouldn't be there in the data. So now I can use this. And I can check all the totals that I don't want. Yeah. So that's gone. And then at this point, you can transpose it back and use first row as headers to fix the headers. Of course, we could have kind of cleaned up the date format or whatever. But essentially, that solves the problem because certain features like filtering are only available rows. Available in the rows, right. In the columns. So we use the transpose idea to flip the data and then clean it up. Oh, this was awesome. This was awesome. My next trick is to help people write shorter if statements in Power Query. Okay, so again, working with this data, the same data that we've been working with. And let's say I want to bucket the regions into two categories. So if you have a South, I'd like to call it as Southwest. If you have a West, again, I'd like to call it as Southwest. If you have east, I'd like to call it as northeast and uh, again, southwest and then for east also again, northeast. So I just want to maybe have two unique regions, either a southwest or a northeast. Now, if you were to do this using Power Query, native features of add column and then if you write a conditional column, the regular if statement would something would look something like this. So I'll just open up the added custom step that I've already done right here. So it says that I want to make a new column called the region new, which is right here. And I want to check if the region equals to south, then southwest. If the region equals to north, then northeast. If the region equals to west, then southwest. And then otherwise northeast. So you just write all the conditions right there and then you're good to go. And then you click on OK and that's about it. If you take a look at the the M right here, the if if function right here, there is a lot of uh, if and else if and else if and things like that. Can we just probably make this shorter? So we're going to use a very interesting list feature. So if you think about it, we are actually pairing the regions in two. So we have pairs of two. So we have we have the south south and the west region to be considered as southwest, and the north and the east to be considered as northeast. So we can just pair that in a list. The way that we do that is something like this. So I'll just maybe go ahead and create one more custom column and in the custom column 
I am going to go ahead and write something like um, new region uh, or let's say region two, whatever. So now I'm going to use a function called list dot contains uh, the list dot contain first part is what's the list that you're trying to work with. So I'm trying to work with a list called South uh, and there are two um, regions in there. And the second item in that list is going to be, let's say West. And in this list, which has two items, if you find any of the items in this value, then that is going to be uh, Southwest. So that if you find it in the region column, that is the region column. Now this is going to give you a true and false. So if you just actually click on OK at the moment, you're going to get true or false. That means yes, um, either South or West was found in this record and therefore you have a true right here. Now I can utilize that true to just maybe write my condition. So I can just say something like if this particular list dot contains is giving you a true output, uh, then in that case you can write Southwest uh, else um, everything else is North or East and we can write uh, Northeast. So North East and that's pretty much about it. Click on OK and we've been able to make a far smaller if condition as compared to that. So if you use list.contains, you can pack a lot of and or conditions in list.contains and just check it anywhere it matches. You can then wrap that around in your if function. That is going to be much shorter. Obviously, this was a pseudo example, but I'm sure people can put this to good use. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Cool. So sending it over to you. So the next one that I have is again a, a problem that I've seen in many workplaces and uh, this is comparing things. So here let's say you're looking at some employees in your organization, you've extracted two points in time. One is employee list as of 1st of July 2024. And this is my list. I have put only just some data, their IDs, names, and which department they're working at that point in time. And you can see there's like 250 people there. And another is earlier this afternoon, we ran another extract and we got this. Obviously, anytime you do this point in time extracts, you'll have different number of rows and mm -hmm. sometimes even the data doesn't match. Uh, so given these two data sets, you may want to, for example, find out who are all the new employees that joined since the last time we, we ran this check. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to send them a welcome letter or whatever, and you just want the names. Or you may also want to know who are the employees that have left or who, have the who are the employees that moved to a different department. For example, again, it will take a while for us to figure this out, but uh, I'm pretty sure there is somebody who changed it to a different department. These are kind of jumbled. So what I'll do is I'll first, uh, you can set them as tables, which is usually the best practice for this kind of data. So sure. I'll, uh, control T on this one. And this is my, uh, we'll call this as staff one. Mm -hmm. And this is staff two. So now we have got mm -hmm. two tables. Let's bring these into Power Query and then I'm going to talk about how we can use joints to do this job for us, the comparison job. Sure. Um, and so we'll take one of these, bring it here. The so staff one comes. I'm just going to duplicate this and change the query to staff two so that both tables are there. Let's just make mm -hmm. this as staff two as well. So staff one, staff two. And what we want is initially, let's just say from staff to perspective, I want to see who the new employees are. So I want to join this to that, uh, but you can use the join concept to do many of these kind of things. So to join, we will use merge queries and we are going to merge it as a new query. So we leave these two as it is, but the new query should tell me who our new employees are. Mm -hmm. And pick staff one as well, select the employee ID, which is the unique identifier. And by default, uh, it does a left outer join, which means all from the first matching from the second. Now what we want is whoever is new in the first, that is the only one that we want. So here uh, you can see that there's lots of different types of joins. Uh, we have got an anti join here, rows only in the first. So what this okay. does is it's basically looks at this data that are only in the first and then it will tell you that. So once you do this, you essentially wow. end up with a shorter table, which is all the new people in the organization. And it also gives you a corresponding row from table one. Obviously that would be null record. 
uh, we don't need this so, and then you end up with just the changes these are the new people who are there in staff two table but not in the one yeah. table so a common case where I, I had to use this technique many many times is I used to do a lot of human resource analytics uh, for government ministries here in New Zealand. I still do them. And many times we want to look at two points in time, employee data, and then create a master list that has everybody, both at point one and point two, like a union of everybody. So, and then for each employee, we want to be able to tag them as current employee, new joinee, lever that means they oh, were I at see. point one but they're no longer in point two or uh, they had an internal movement so for example they moved from one job title to another job title one department to another department and all of that and we wanted to tag people like that and once the tagging is done then that became the source for power bi report wherein i could for example slice yeah. on all yeah. the new the joints new and yeah. then i okay. can see Interesting. or i can see all the internal movements uh, because many times managers would say oh we are overloaded with new people but you look at their head count the head count wouldn't have changed it was 10 people before 10 people now so what is this new people you are talking about it's because all the 10 left and new 10 people came right but at a aggregate level it doesn't tell you the story so this was essential for us to paint the picture of who is getting dragged down with all of these movements and all of the extra oh, okay. work that comes with it. That's, so that's, a really that's how we case. can use yeah. these joins. Yeah, that's a really practical case. I'm sure that if anybody looking at it from an HR perspective would like immediately find the use of it. Yeah. This is not really like a full-fledged trick. It's like a slight debugging thing that I use it often when I'm writing formulas in the formula bar in the M um, window right here, in the Power Query window right here. So I've got a query and let's say I'm writing a formula, any formula. So I'll just maybe click on a new step that makes a new step and I'll start to write some formula. So I'll just say that table dot trans, transform columns and I'll start the bracket. Now, perhaps let's just say that I forget, hey, what was the syntax of this function? or I need help in this moment where I'm writing the formula right here. If you just maybe commit on the broken query, it just gives you an error because the query was not sufficiently written and you have a missing syntax or the parts of the formula are not there, so the query breaks. But this is a very, very scary picture for a lot of people because unless you adhere to every single comma and syntax syntactical requirement out there, the query obviously is going to break. So what I do is I play a trick. I go ahead in the middle of the formula and I'll start a list through the curly bracket and I'll comment out the first part and then after that I will write whatever I want to write. So maybe I want to let's say reference it back to the source step. I want to take a look at the table in the previous step or I want to take a look at any other step. So I can just go ahead and write source over there, source and I can close it, I can press enter and it actually gives me a table that I can preview. That's one use. The second use is that uh, what I can do is without actually losing the half formula that I have written, if I want to take a look at the documentation of this very function, I can just copy that and replace that with the source and press enter. And this actually gives me the function and I can take a look at the documentation of the function, read through it, maybe see what am I doing wrong or things like that. The point is that as soon as you contain this value, commented value in a list, it doesn't get executed, you don't get an error. And then you can do whatever here as an additional part to just maybe rectify the error, do something additional, test out another value and things like that. Once you're done, you can actually delete all of this part. So uh, I can delete it, I can delete it, and I can get back to writing the formula like the way that I was writing it. So I use it a lot. I, I'm hoping that people are going to find value uh, in using yeah. this little trick of creating an interim list and feeding multiple values there. And whichever value is feeding in an error, you can just comment that out and just create more values and see what value works and then feed that into your function and make it right. So that was a little trick that from my cool. side. Yeah. I'm going to piggyback on that. Uh, you can stay on your screen. Okay, cool. This is something that I saw on LinkedIn or, and uh, I'm not even sure if it's from you or someone else, but uh, what I found, and this is very helpful is, you can just transform columns and then at the end of it, remove all of the things like source and everything yeah. because the contention is, and if you hit enter now, you'll get the full documentation the of that documentation, function right yeah, yeah. here. 
yeah. and you can kind of see all the examples and everything that's so true. many times that is the problem for us like we are, we yes. we are trying something and we don't know if the syntax for this is this or yes what is the expected value at this point and something like that cool so yeah uh, that's a that's actually a good trick i i think i remember sharing that on linkedin uh, but yeah. i'm it could be somebody else as well so mm. anyways nice uh, over to you chandu so the next one is let's say you're dealing with some data like this where you have got a date and i mean this is a blown up data so it's needlessly long uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to duplicate this and in this i'm just going to take out all of this thing so we are only looking at a condensed version of the data just a few rows mm -hmm. and you have got mm -hmm. some date and many times when you have a date column you may want to do something on top of that date to help you with the further downstream reporting needs that's right. for example i've got the shipment date and in my report i would like to see all the shipments that we did in the last week mm -hmm. but the last week itself is a relative concept uh, so it will change every day every day the last week rolling window needs to move so one one way of doing this is we can let this be a problem of the reporting layer the power bi or power pivot or excel or whatever happens to be that uh, but we don't have to wait that far we can actually automatically tag dates right here in power query so that the date adjacent to it i can have a column that tells me this hmm. week last week older dates oh, okay okay so then that column only has three possible values let's say this week last week and older dates and in power bi i can set a slicer that always says this week hmm. and it can be a slicer on the screen or it could be a page level filter or something like that so that every time you refresh the report the data changes the dates change new tagging up automatically applies and your report will always show as this week so uh, it it kind of saves right. a lot of time and it yeah. takes out a lot of unnecessary um, extra processing either through dax or filters or anything else so to do this is very simple it's uh, not as much of a mystery um, all we have to do is make sure this is a date and once this is a date we can kind of use various date related things to do this what i'll do is i'll do something simple uh, but the logic is same so we are going to do this month and all uh, older dates kind of a thing so from this date i'm going to add a um, i'm going to add a custom column and this is we are going to say current month start Mm -hmm. and and we want to have uh, uh the date time dot local now which will basically give us this we'll go one step at a time sure um essentially that that's going to tell you what is the current date and time so uh, we have 14th of august 666 and it is the local time so it's as of your computer but if you're publishing and across time zones and all of that you'll need to change some of this logic so what we can do is we can uh, of course we can kind of convert this into a date and then um, and then move it to the starting point of the month uh, you can do this as one step at a time or mm. if you are feeling comfortable at this point uh, you know obviously watching chandeep's channel you, <laughs> you would know your way around them um, so you may want to kind of pack everything in this so you can say date time dot local now um, and then from this we just want to get the date portion alone again uh, normally this kind of m coding is something that i shy away from uh, simply because i'm too lazy for this sure. but another trick that i i normally do is if i get too stuck i click on this link this oh, is the most useful link in all of power query for me <laughs> this opens up the query reference page with all the functions everything is here i got date functions i can see what is the function that i need to do use because many times uh, the problem is not not knowing the syntax of table dot add columns it's just the fact that yeah. we don't even know that function exists, exists. in the first place <laughs> that's right uh, and you can see just with the date itself there is so many of them yeah uh, and then um, you know you can have more of these as well so what we will do is you can help me here uh, i think you if you want to extract the date that's going to be date dot from i guess oh okay date from all right 
so that that gives us up to the date we can go back here and then we can we want to go to the start of the month uh, so this is the most annoying bit with the m so i'll i'll, I'll maybe i'll just maybe tell you a trick uh and you can just press ctrl z get back to your formula Mm. Um, so uh, the initial formula date dot from uh, until that so you can delete everything before date dot from which is the formula that you just wrote so imagine that you were here and you wanted to write uh, the function date dot start of the month yeah so you start you go to the equals to sign and you start writing the dot and then you write uh, start of the month and press tab and it works yeah Okay. It doesn't eat into your formula or anything. I I like to complain <laughs> rather than do this <laughs> simply yeah, yeah. because I feel like the developers here are extremely <laughs> lazy, sloppy. It has been around for five six years. For, it needs yeah, to be said out the, loud yeah, that yeah. this auto suggest is by far the worst across the entire <laughs> spectrum of the tools that they have got going. <laughs> they need to improve this. Uh, you can't. Uh, I mean, I the tricks are there. Like for example, this is the trick that uh, uh, that I have been using. Like you can't type dot. You have to type start of the month and yeah. let the dot be part of the auto complete. But that's not how any coding platform works. Any, I mean, yeah, their own platforms right. like VS Code yeah. and other things. Yeah, that, that's right. So let's not excuse them. Uh, let's call <laughs> yeah. it out as really sloppy product. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, that is good to know. I'm gonna use that from here on so that I don't embarrass the, myself. The only trick, yeah. the only trick, uh, the only problem with not writing the dot and just writing date dot start of month all together in one go is that. If you are wrapping that as a wrapper to any other function, it'll eat into the mm. function which is inside. So, so do the you dot always have to start with the dot. And dot, okay. yeah, dot works fine. So that's like I've been trying out multiple things. Mm. So the dot trick has been the most robust one that I have seen so far. Okay, so so far this is self-explanatory, and I think date dot start of month seems to take date time. So I'm, I'll kind of test this. Okay, so that kind of works. I mean, it returned a timestamp, but this is fine. Yeah. So fine. now yeah. that we have got that and we've got this, uh, we can basically um, we can kind of check this against that to see what is this. And you can either use uh, a conditional column or custom column. Um, and this is my date type column. And here we can say if um, date is less than current month start then I think you'll have to write the part previous dates then else uh, this month I mean this is kind of a yeah. lazy check because it could be a future yeah. date as well but uh, for now we'll just live with that so you will have this month and previous dates this month, yeah, and cool. you can just remove that and now you have got a tag on every day to work with that's right yeah. interesting so this is uh, you can apply this it at a calendar table level which is something that i've been doing with most of my models so that in the calendar table itself i know when today is when the current week is when the current month is and i can use that as a dynamic filter or or a setting for building some dax or whatever further down i so think the place the, where yeah, I think the place where I've used this the most is uh, creating a column in the calendar table to mark this as the current month. Mm. So a lot of times people would not like when the report gets refreshed the next month, people mm. would not like to go back to the they would not even take a look at that. There is a slicer up on the top that is referencing the previous month yet. Yeah. And they're just going to outrightly say that the numbers are not right, even though the refresh you know went through. So you can automatically create a column, which is, let's say, the current month column. And then the slicer sets to current month always. So that, yeah, that's, that's a very, very handy trick for sure. All right. Cool. I believe we are doing seven each. So here is my trick. All right. So if you take a look at my screen at the moment, my query has a couple of steps. So source, change type, uh, then I extract the, then I extract the year from this particular date. That's my extracted year. Uh, and then I apply the group. So to get the total sales, I have a all rows table, then I extract the max sales. So if you take a look at this particular table, this is the entire data for 2005. And whatever is the max value, I extract that right here. And then there's a change type step applied. Now, the steps that I have done don't matter as much, but a lot of times you're going to be working with tables which are nested. So you can see that we have an outer table 
and then one of the column also contains the tables inside of that so these are nested tables and sometimes you would want to open up a certain table. So I want maybe want to open up the first table or open up the second table. So now what happens is that if you're perhaps on the group rows step or the added or maybe this particular step, and if you accidentally click on this particular step, let's say added uh, the table, if you click on it, this is going to give you a warning. That means that the next step is going to be like a navigation step. And that is going to override all the steps that you have done so far in the query. And the query is just going to show the result of this table. So People do it and if their query is long, they are going to like literally lose all the steps. And unfortunately, there is no control Z in, mm. in Power Query. So what do you do with this? So what we're going to do is instead of actually clicking on this and we still want to open it, we're going to create a new step in the end. So I click on it. And right now, the step that I have created, which is custom one, uh, this step is referring back to change type, which is just the previous step. But I don't really want to mm. refer it to change type. I instead want to refer it to the group row step. So I can just change the code right here and I can say hash group rows. Uh, this is going to refer it back to this particular table. Now, what we want to do is from this table, I want to navigate to the first table right here. So the way that you navigate is that you first mention what column do you want to go through. So I want to, I want to take a look at the all rows column. That's the first thing that I will do. So I'll say in the square bracket, I'll say all rows columns is what I am trying to reference it to. And this is going to give me only these two values, which is table one and table two. And you can see that in the list. Now, once you have a list of the two tables, you can then mention which item do you want to reference it to. So I maybe want to reference the first item. So I can put the curly brackets in and I can say zero. Zero means the first item. The counting starts with zero. This is the zeroth item. This is the first item, so on and so forth. So I want to reference the first table and that opens up this particular table. So rather than actually clicking on the table and then losing all the steps, you can make a custom step and essentially do whatever Power Query UI is going to do it, but mm. you actually write the M code on your own and rather than actually saving, like losing the steps, you can actually save all the steps that you've done. So that was yeah. my little navigation trick to take a look at the underlying table. That's pretty cool. Okay, over to you. All right, uh, so the last one is not really a screen trick. It's more of a performance or optimization trick. Many times Power Query is used to automate a lot of data cleanup activities in one go. So a simple thing that most people, they get excited when they start learning Power Query is the folder automation. Uh, absolutely. Let's say you've got a bunch of spreadsheets or PDFs or JSONs or whatever it is in a big folder, one folder, nested folders, whatever it is. You can just connect to it. You can set up a um, transform sample, which is basically you're telling mm -hmm. what to do for one file and then it just does it for all the files. Now, the problem is this is like a double-edged sword. You discover this awesome power and then you go overboard with it. You start building folder automations where uh, you're taking each file and you're doing so many things on top of it and then you're combining it. And then you realize that the refresh takes 30 minutes, 45 minutes, three hours at a time. Oh, okay. Because of this automation that you have set up where it needs to happen for everything. So one simple trick, and this is something that I have seen time and again work very well to speed up such slow power queries is you see in a folder automation, what we are doing is we are doing the same operation mm -hmm. across all the files. Mm -hmm. And we are telling Power Query what we want with this transform sample. Mm -hmm. So the way Power Query works is if you are doing, let's say you're connecting to a folder and you're extracting data from 25 PDFs, every PDF you're getting it in the transform sample. Um, you said, go to the PDF, go to table 17, get it, take out right. these three columns, right. uh, do this group by, then do this, do that. So mm -hmm. you built up your transform sample. If you put 10 steps in the transform sample, those 10 steps need to happen 25 times. Correct. And it is a sequential operation. So 10 steps on file one, then goes to 10 steps on file two, 10 steps on file three. I mean, there might be some parallel thing happening behind scenes. We don't know that, but essentially it's, it's a step-by-step -step operation. So to speed things up, what you should think about is only do the bare minimum in the transform sample. Don't do whole bunch of operations just because mm, you can just do what is the m most essential and basic stuff that is if you want to go navigate get a table just do that that's it don't worry about removing nulls and taking out columns and all of that nonsense 
because that used to be the that is the bottleneck your files on physical location going and getting them that is the bottleneck once all the files all the data is there inside power query then that combined data that is where you can do the operation of taking yeah, out nulls right. or uh, you know mm, renaming columns and all of that other steps so that that process becomes faster so this is a simple shift in the order of our activities that you're doing and even if at that point is too slow then i'll start questioning whether you should be doing some of these operations or uh, maybe there should be some other way of handling this for older files and newer files and very interesting thing. very interesting i think yeah i think you're absolutely right uh, because uh, people get started with the ui and the the drug to using power query is definitely uh, combined data of, of files from a folder and that's where it just bloats up and you know you get these supporting queries and if you load up these supporting queries into with multiple steps Mm-hmm. then people don't realize that those steps are being redone for as many number of tables or files or sheets there are in that excel file or in that folder or whatever that is so yeah it's it's a, i think it's a very very good tool okay uh the last one from my side i'm hoping this is going to be like helpful to people so i'm working with this simple table unfortunately this table has got two junk rows up on the top I would like to remove the two junk rows up on the top and then this should be the header of the data and then this is where the data actually is so i've just like labeled it as pseudo data but you know you get the point now generally speaking the pattern that people tend to follow is that they will go to the home tab and they'll say remove the rows remove the top rows and they'll say hey i want to remove the top two number of rows and click on okay and the two rows are gone they are then going to promote these headers and the data is kind of good to go the only problem with that is that what if you did not have static number of junk rows up on the top sometimes they can be two sometimes they can be three you don't really know how many mm-hmm. junk rows are there on the top so what do you do in that scenario so i'm going to tell you a couple of variations in which you can play around with this function so if you if i just do that once again so if i just go to the home tab and say remove rows remove top rows and i'll just fixate that to number 2 click on okay i get this function table dot skip where this is a hard coded input which is the number 2 now i would want to play around with this number 2 as to how many ways there are that I can automate it and I'll tell you a couple of patterns and once you understand couple of patterns then anybody would be able to mold it to whatever situation that they are working with so I don't really want to maybe skip the first two rows of the data I want it to be based on a condition so my condition if you take a look at the data seems something like this so the most rudimentary condition that I can think of is that go to column number 1 in column number 1 see where do you hit the title h1 that's my header number 1 so remove this remove this as soon as you get to h1 that is when you should start stop removing the rows from the top now the table dot skip function works something like this it works on the false logic so the table dot skip function could have a number input like the way that we have provided it it could also have a boolean input or like a condition input and the condition should give you it will stop to execute when you get the first false so once you get a true here this is going to be executed and the row is going to be removed if you get a true here it's going to be executed and the row is going to be removed as soon as you get the first false this is where it will stop working that's the logic in which the table dot skip function works so i can go ahead and say something like instead of writing a hard coded to i'm going to say that please go in each row and in each row why don't you check for column 1 this is my column and column 1 should not be equal to h1 now the reason why i'm saying not be equal uh, sorry uh, i have to close the bracket so the reason why i'm saying not equal to h1 is because is this not equal to h1 the answer is true uh, is this not equal to h1 the answer is true is this not equal to h1 the answer is false and that's why it's going to stop here that's why i wrote the not equals to sign So you can use this, let's say, uh, the second part of table dot skip function in very creative ways. Now that's one example. I want to maybe give another example. Now people are going to come and say that, hey, I don't even know if h1 is a valid header. Like you have hard coded the value here. I don't even know what my actual header of the data is. It could be a date, it could be a sales rep, it could be any other value. So I don't really want to hard code this value. Now what do we do? So again, we will use a table dot skip function, but resort to some other pattern of solving the same problem. So I'll go back to the source here and try to figure out another pattern. 
One pattern that I can see is that if I have junk rows, the junk rows will at least have a null. Like all of the columns cannot be filled. That's what I'm assuming my pattern to be. Right now, you can see that we have two nulls here. We have two nulls here. And the time that I see the entire row is filled, that is what I'm going to consider as my legit header row. This is my legit header row. So this is what the pattern is. Now, how do we identify and how do we write the code for at least finding one null value here is let's say something that we will work, work on. So I'm going to remove this uh, function that I have written and maybe create a custom column just to test out my imagination here. So in the custom column, I will go ahead and start to write an underscore. And as soon as I write the underscore, I click on OK. What I get is a record. Record is nothing but the row of the data. Now, if you maybe peek into the record, I'll not click on it, I'll peek into it, you're going to see that what we have gotten here is the entire first row. So in the first row, we had junk, null, and null, and that's what we have received it right here, junk, null, and null. In the second row, we again have junk, null, and null, and in the third row, we have H1, H2, H3. We've got the record. The only problem with the record is that record comes in pairs. It has the value, it has the column header, but I just want to work with the values, not with the column header. So I'm going to go ahead and start to modify my code. I'm going to say something like record, oops, record dot to list. I want to convert the record into a list so that I just get these three values and I just skip the headers right here. I'm going to click on OK and instead of record, I get a list and the list is feeding up with the values. So I can see junk null and null, uh, junk null and null and h1, h2, h3. At this time, all that I would do is just try to find that in this list that I have, is there any null value or not? So I can just say something like list.contains. Uh, I can say that, hey, here is my list that I'm trying to work with. Does this contain a null value or not? So uh, I can just close the bracket. And this is going to give me a true and false. Click on OK. And you get a true and false. This is exactly what we were trying to fetch when we were trying to write the table.skip function. You can see that here is where we have the first false coming in. And this is all true. That means skip all of these top rows up on the top. Now, at the moment, we have added a column and we have been able to take a look at the logic, but the logic is right here. This is the part of the logic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead in my code and copy this logic, control C, click on OK, and remove the column that I have created. And I'm going to get back to writing the table.skip function once again. So let's use the UI. In the home tab, uh, remove rows, remove rows from the top. I will again hard code that with number two. This gives me that. Now I will say because I want to check in every single row. Therefore, I will write the each keyword. And after the each keyword, I will just paste my logic that I just wrote a while ago and just remove the extra brackets and everything. And that's pretty much it. I think I have to close the last, last bracket here. And that's pretty much it. Now the result is going to be the same because we just had two rows, but this logic is dynamically checking for the any null value in the first few rows considered to be as junk. As soon as you have the first completely filled row that it believes it to be your header, you can then do the promote header step and start to work with your data ahead. Cool. Okay, uh, Chandu, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, come over. I mean, I've met you a couple of times and I do not even fall short of the awesomeness that I have um, by meeting every single time. Thank you for doing this. It's my pleasure and uh, I'm really amazed at how much we have covered in, in <laughs> I think. But more importantly, it's always fun talking to you and seeing all the nice little tricks. Uh, I'm going to remember to use the dot. <laughs> I, I type in stuff there. Um, and yeah, all the best with this video. And uh, for everybody who is watching Chandeep's channel, I want to remind you that you need to subscribe to his channel and follow his videos, share everything that he is teaching you. It's just literal gold scattered on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so it's much. It's just I... too good content. Subscribe to him and tell your friends how you're getting awesome at work. This is how you're doing it. Tell Thank everybody you. Thank about you. this. Thank you, Chandu. And, uh, if people want to find your channel, I'm sure 100% of my audience is already subscribed to your channel. <laughs> but in case there are like, say, a few hundred people out here who are finding uh, your channel to be a new one, where should they go and take a look at your work? So they can search up on YouTube for Chandu. Chandu is my uh, name and uh, that's the channel name as well. I also have a smaller but equally kind of like popular and valuable Telugu channel. So in case you're trying oh, to learn see. Excel and Power BI and Power Query, but you're like, oh, I couldn't be bothered to learn in English. 
you can go there and learn in telugu very interesting to speak that very language <laughs> but yeah very interesting chandu search for that on youtube you'll find my channel excellent thanks for doing this chandu thank you so much